Ni hao ma. Oh, yeah, means hello. All right. All right. Do you speak Mandarin? Kohima. I think I'm ahead of you on, on coffee. This is my tent for today. Uh, this is a pot. <laughs> pot of coffee. Nice to meet you, man. I appreciate you doing this with me. Oh, no. It's, it's something I, I, you know, every so often, there's a lot of channels out there that I kind of like. But there's ones, uh, okay, I mean, let me put it there. There's, there's a few that I really like. Yeah. That fall into like 5%. There's another 5% that I'm kind of, eh, either way. And then there's like 90% that I just, I can't after like 30 seconds. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I being a creator, I don't have a lot of time, as you know, to watch a lot of video. Scott, when I came across your channel, it was that video that you were doing on scooters in the United States, mm -hmm. which, of course, is a very small scooter market. Now, now, let me tell you a funny story about two American friends of mine that lived here for 20 years. When they moved back to the United States, we were always in touch by email. And both of them, one lives in a place called Okeechobee, Florida. The other is someplace in New York State. I think it's near the yeah. Canadian border. And they both sent me an email probably within like within eight months of each other saying, oh, we finally bought a scooter here. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm very surprised. They sort of, And they told me both the same thing. After 20 years living in Taiwan, they felt that the scooter was just so convenient for them that they kind of right. missed it when they got back to the U.S. and they were looking around and they were very surprised at the price differences. Oh, yeah. uh, and they said a lot of people look at, looked at them crazy because they were, they were traveling like maybe 35, 40, 45 minutes to get to work every day. And sometimes it was raining. They said they just put a raincoat on. Um, why, why do you think scooters really haven't caught on? Is, is it like you said in your, in your video, just geographical? Yeah, I, I contemplated this for many years, and before I even bought my scooter, I'm like, you know, those look pretty cool. I'm not, I never even rode one before I bought mine, to be honest with you. I see when we go on vacation, like some of the boardwalks here in the States where you go down to like Florida and some of the coastal regions where they got these little scooters you can rent. Um, big rental uh, market for those like in warmer climates. See, I live in Ohio, which is kind of in the Midwest, um, kind of in the middle of the, the country. So it gets cold and we only have about three or four months of like doable weather to ride. So I'm already behind the eight ball unless I buy heavy, heavy winter gear, which I haven't done yet. So, but anyway, I, I, I see these scooters and I, I always wanted to rent one down there in Florida. Right. And just never got around to it. But then when I was researching bikes, um, I thought it might be let me try one of these out instead of getting a big, heavy, clunky bike that I've had, you know, three decades ago. I wanted to try something simple, twist and go and not really have a lot of complication to it. Where mm -hmm. I can just get out there and not ride across the country, but, you know, just around the hometown, check out the city and some of the hidden destinations. And that's what I bought it for. You know, it's, and it's perfect. So you're you're in Ohio. I'm just curious, what is the. I mean, for example, if I step out my door right now, um, if I go left, there's three shops this way. If I turn right, there's another four shops, and then around the corner, another five shops. They're, I mean, they're, and they're open seven nights a week till ten o'clock at night. What What about in Ohio? And what What kind of choice do you have? I mean, here, here we're kind of spoiled for choice. You name it, every scooter shop, unless they specialize in in one brand. Uh, but the independent small sometimes carry m multiple brands and they'll have maybe like, you know, 20 or 30 different models from different uh, manufacturers. Yeah, we have a lot of, of choices here as far as scooter brands, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got, well, the Honda, of course, the Yamaha X Max and stuff. And of course, you have the all the little uh, step throughs, what you call them. You know, we have a lot of those, but they're they're very hard to come by. You know, you have different dealerships that have these scooters, but what we found, and I get, I get a lot of comments on this from folks that leave comments on my channel that they've been trying to buy a scooter for a year and the main, the dealers just can't get them. Um, and I don't know why that is. I think it's supply demand. Like I said in my video, I just don't think the dealerships are, I mean, I think the need is there. Mm -hmm. I just don't think, 
I don't know what that where that gap is, why they can't get more in the country. Um, I think they might be just limited on supply, the dealerships themselves. Maybe they're just allotted so many a year, and I, I don't know that answer, but I got very lucky because I was trying to find a PCX 150 for a good year and a half. I could not find one. I mean, they had them around the country, but I didn't want to pay $400, $500 to have it shipped to me, and no dealer does that because of liability they make you go find your own transportation to ship it to yourself you know i found and i well, i'll just wait so i waited and waited and three adv 150s finally popped into the honda dealership that's 25 minutes down the road i'm like yes so i went down there and as soon as i saw one in person i'm like that's my bike and that's how it started you know not far from here is um we also have costco in taiwan and next to Costco is a very big independent dealer in northern Taiwan called Li Jun. And the last time I went was like two weeks ago. They had two flatbed trucks outside, 18 wheeler types, mm -hmm. double decker with scooter, 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 just for that one location. Well, they're, they're close. We, by the way, we shop at Costco too. I get a membership every year. And uh, question Do they sell scooters in Costco in the US? No, I've not seen scooters yet, no. Okay, here they do. They carry Vespa and Kimco. Really? Yeah. I've not known that. Yeah, I was going to go buy tires from Costco, but uh, just because they don't have alignments there, I had to go somewhere out because I needed my car aligned right when I bought tires. That's the best thing you can do. They just slap them on and they balance them, but Costco does not have an alignment why i don't know i guess it's a pretty big apparatus and it's just one thing that they don't want to invest in but i think if they had the alignment factor that's another topic but that would be a huge bonus to them i really think, if you're listening yeah, here, yeah. here's the same thing they don't they also don't they sell tire they do the balancing but they also don't do alignment um yeah that's weird every foreigner that i know that has come and has lived here for for either one year sometimes they find that when they go back home how spoiled they were just because everything is so convenient. Um, for example, for our, for when I have to pay my road tax on my bikes or renewing my license or renewing the insurance, I don't go to a bank. I don't go to the insurance companies. I go to 7-Eleven. Really? They have the machines. You just do everything there in the machine and it's all done. Yeah, we have to go to the BMB, they call it, Bureau of yeah. and and wait in line. It's gotten better, but that it's nobody likes to go to the BMB. I mean, you, 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 you just wait for a long time and it's, you have to drive there. So everything's done at one central. Yeah. We don't have the convenience factor like that. That would be nice where you can, a lot of stuff though, they're we're moving online so I can renew my license, my tags. I can just go onto the BMB website and actually do that now, which is nice. So they're making improvements. In the state that you're in, do you have to do annual, uh, what they call them, um, environmental inspections of the bike? No, we used to have to do that with auto, uh, vehicles, the emission type stuff. Right. That was years ago, and they, it was it was kind of just a, a short-lived thing where it might have been, this was like 30 years ago, I remember, going having to do the emissions test and stuff where somebody looks in your hood, make sure you have all the emission stuff in there, and but... Not anymore. They they just disassembled that for some reason. Now they don't worry about it mm -hmm. for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah. Here it's something they do. So if, if you have a new bike, you don't have to do it for 10 years. Oh, wow. After 10 years, you have to do it once a year. If the bike or car is over 20 years old, you have to do it twice a year. Like admission stuff? Emission stuff. But I mean... Um, I, I have one bike that I have to do it on twice a year. It's an old BMW. But for when I show up at the testing center to when I leave, it's like 15, 20 minutes. You drive in, you hand them, your, you hand them your, your registration license at the beginning. You do each step. At the end, they hand it back to you and you go. And that's it. Ah, okay. But they're a little bit, here they're a little bit funny on, <laughs> on modifications. They really don't like when you modify bikes. So if you have a bike or car that you've painted and you sell it, they're going to fine you because you didn't register oh. the new color. Wow. If you put an exhaust on that isn't stock to the bike, when it comes time to sell it, 
you have to put the original stock one on the bike to be able to transfer right. over. Otherwise, sense. they give you, the, you know, even they, they test things like the strength of the lights. So LED lights have to meet a certain requirement. They can't go above a certain illumination. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they, they're very finicky on that. I mean, here in Taiwan, one of the reasons why, especially imported bikes, are very expensive. If you're a big manufacturer like Honda and Yamaha and you're just importing big lots of them, that's different. But when you're an independent dealer sourcing them from different places, you physically have to get that bike tested for practically everything, which could take three to four months before you can sell it. Yeah, yeah, we don't have none of that here. <laughs> they're very... They're very sort of Japanese on their approach, meaning that every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed, and if there's one mistake along the process, they say you have to start all over again. I don't know if it's just more because it's a smaller country. Of course, Taiwan could fit in the inside of Florida here and yeah. it still fit. <laughs> yeah, so it's probably a lot easier to control that type of situation than just every state in a big giant land like us trying to control those things it would be a nightmare i believe so that's maybe why they do it right you have a yeah the pollution here is not too bad but i think they could do a better job with emissions and you see these big trucks going down the road that are just billowing this black smoke out purposely um you think there would be laws against that but none of that stuff's enforced at all so, mm -hmm. and now people are getting the bright lights for the leds for their vehicles again I don't know if cops will pull you over or not, but they're blinding me now. You know, I'm going down the road. It's like, oh my gosh. They're terrible, aren't they? They're, you know, they're, especially when you're in an environment, if you're in the mountains where there's those street lights and this thing is bellowing, you know, in, in front of you, yeah. just blinding. But especially, yeah, if your windows aren't real clean, it's, it's not fun to deal with. But mm -hmm. uh, I just find in the U.S., a lot of things are not properly it's just impossible to control it, I think. And it gets so big, there's so many people that that's the, the consequences is just the control factor. Now they made a really silly law. It's not silly, but how can you enforce people that if they're driving and they're looking at their phone, that's illegal now. You have yeah. to get in a holder, but if you look at it for more than, I think they said like two or three seconds, technically you could be fine for that or something. Are, are police officers gonna enforce that? really no no yeah i mean it's things to do yeah police, police here are, are, are a little bit funny um here uh i have to say the police are quite polite so if they pull you over and they check that you even if you're speeding 20 kilometers over the speed limit where you know you should be going slower if they check and you have no prior infractions, at least over the last five years, they'll say, look, we're just going to give you a warning today that you shouldn't be doing 80. It's because they don't want to do the paperwork. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. It's, it's uh, by the way, I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. Ni hao ma. Oh, yeah, I mean, hello. All right. Or do you speak Mandarin? Kuima. I don't know what that means. And I'll just keep saying ni hao ma. <laughs> so what do you look that up for you? Oh, <laughs> I wrote yeah. it down. Like I'm going to say that to him. <laughs> Taiwan's in a weird place because in cities like in in what, what year is it? I think it's by 2030. Taiwan is going to have two official languages. One is Mandarin, mm -hmm. and they're making English the second official language. Really? So there's a big push now. All government agencies uh, within the next few years have to provide all their service in Mandarin and English. Many of them already do. Many of them already do. I mean, um, most police officers in big cities like Taipei, Kaohsiung, Tainan, uh, Yilan, and other places, uh, police officers that are younger, let's say under 35 or 40, at least 70 or 80 percent of them speak English already. Does most of the folks over there speak English or is it kind of a mixture of Mandarin English? It really depends where and, and how old the, the how old they are like for example right. the younger generation are more inclined to speak english as uh to, to know english yeah that makes sense and let's say the, the older generation so you probably picked it up pretty well over the years Man. well i mean I, I learned mandarin even before i came to Taiwan. oh did you yeah when i was growing up for grade four and grade five my parents were in singapore okay so i i started learning it there and actually it's people get <laughs> the funny thing is People kind of get intimidated by it, but actually it's a lot easier 
than you may think. The only difficulty that I have sometimes is, and this is funny in Taiwan, uh, we have a motoring show here in Taiwan that's a little bit like Top Gear or the Grand Tour. It's on one of the local TV channels. It's in Mandarin, but they put subtitles in Chinese. Okay, interesting. Because, for example, just in my area alone, if I walk two blocks, they speak a completely different type of Mandarin, a dialect of Mandarin. Interesting. Okay, I got you. So if you're in Taipei City, but then you go to southern Taiwan, sometimes people will have difficulty understanding each other. The written is exactly the same. But the pronunciation is different, so it's kind of, it is kind of amusing sometimes. Like I've been into in, in taxis before, and there's a language that's spoken here called Hakka, which is uh, it's one of the Aboriginal languages of indigenous Taiwanese, and it's a mixture of this old language and Mandarin together. But if if you didn't know Mandarin, it sounds like you're listening to Thai. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. You said you were Dutch. Are you from the Netherlands originally? Well, my mother is Dutch, father is French, but we, I grew up in a lot of English-speaking countries. As I, I tell people, I was conceived in the Netherlands, but I was born in Canada. But I left Canada when I was like three months old. So you've heard of Itchy Boots, right? The, the... Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, that's the Nor- channel I follow. Um, I, her opportunity to travel the world would be amazing. Uh, can't do that right now. But... Art, she is so smart. Do you, do you know what her background is? You know, I, I read it once, but I, it doesn't come to mind anymore. I can't remember. She works for a gold mining company as a geologist. Oh, geologist. Okay, yeah. And that's how she made her money. Because if a geologist finds gold, they get a certain percentage. Wow. Well, yeah, that's a good deal. And then by the time I think she was making 25 or 26 or 27 she said i don't need to work anymore and i I, i've heard of other geologists that do the same wow yeah i didn't know that much but i like watching her because of of course the adventure and i get a lot of ideas from watching those type of channels like how i present things but i don't have a drone or anything and i don't think i mean if i want to add that to my arsenal one day i thought do you have a drone no 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 yeah I, I'm trying to limit my tech. I mean, I think adding a second camera was helpful to kind of give a different perspective once in a while. I kind of like that. Got some good comments on that. So it's you kind of switch back and forth a little bit so they can see what's behind you as you're going, which is kind of cool sometimes. But right. never went the drone route yet. I don't think for what I do, it would be really practical for to have one because I don't get out too far away. I'm not traveling the world or anything. So... Mm-hmm. What you're going to see is like city, you know, and I live in a really big city. I just another channel you should, maybe you've heard of it, Million Dollar Bogan. Uh-uh, I have not. You have, to, okay, his name is Daniel Hayes. And when he started this channel many years ago, he had like 50 views, 10 views. And then all of a sudden he became like 2 million subscribers. What's it called? Million Dollar what? Million Dollar Bogan. He's, he's from Australia. Okay. Hmm. There's so many channels out there, man. Yeah, I got into, I actually, I got into this filming my rides from watching uh, other Moto Vlog channels, right? And I'm like, I could do that. That looks fun. And that's how it started. I mean, it was just that simple. And I bought a little cheap camera, GoPro, and a couple years, three years later, I'm still here doing it. But it it becomes addicting after a while, as you probably already know. I... <laughs> I've ridden in the U.S. before, and I have first question, and this is an easy one to answer, I think. Why are your speed limits so bloody slow? I, I was there, and I was doing this mountain ride, and it was like 55 before the mountains, and then in the mountains, the big sign said, must go down to 25. I'm like, really? what is this? Yeah, 65 is kind of the norm, I would say, on the freeway systems, the highway. 65, uh-huh. and I've said this a lot in my videos i don't really like to ride on the freeway because the people that are on their phones or they're weaving i mean they're literally going in and out of lanes and it's like you don't want to mix that with a 300 pound motorbike so i try to avoid the highways i i can do it on my bike but i just prefer to say off the the highways and i mean it's really not if you're on the road anywhere there's always that chance right but um I think I lessen it by staying off the highways. You, you don't find the speed limits too slow sometimes? Sometimes I do on the back roads. Like I've had people 
comment on if I'm going over 25 in like a residential zone where the <laughs> and stuff. Tell them, uh, people will let me know, trust me. Uh, like, well, you're going 25 or you're going 35 and a 25. And I'm like, you know, so it's so, it's so easy to do because when you're riding, sometimes it's hard to get the sensation how fast you're really going. Mm -hmm. 25 is pretty slow, but for the most part, I think most roads, if it's not a posted speed limit, I think the general rule is 35 miles per hour, which is pretty slow, but I just drive, I ride casually. You know, you got the guys on the sport bikes that, that you like to open it up and get on them 55. I think the bypass right near my home is 55. It's not a freeway, but it's, it's like a bypass from the major roads. And sometimes you can, those are 55. I think that's pretty, pretty doable. We have this app in Taiwan, which is quite fascinating. It's called Radar Bot. And how Radar, Radar Bot works here is, I mean, this place is like speed camera central, but it's always updated on which speed cameras are working, which ones are not working, okay. which ones are down for maintenance. And when they're down for maintenance and not working, everybody goes to them. <laughs> So yeah, are those, is speed limits really controlled there though? I'm taking it like um, well, enforced it. Here, what they do is they don't check. Okay, they don't see how fast you're going. But what will happen, for example, in one section, uh, there's an expressway which goes south called the number 64, and in some sections, there's a camera that will take your, the picture of your bike or your car going into it, and then time you how long it takes to exit a certain area. So gotcha. you. If if it's if you should be doing it in ten minutes, but you do it in six, then okay. you get a ticket in the mail. Yeah, it's time factor. Okay. Yeah. I got a ticket once in the mail from for uh, it was a speed trap. They later found out and they gave us all our money back. Believe it or not, but there was a speed trap that went from like it was crazy, like fifty five to thirty five, like immediately, and you had mm -hmm. really no warning. And the, they sent me a picture, uh, something in the mail with the picture of our SUV and you could see the brake lights on. I was slowing down, but they get you that quickly. And um, I went to fight it, but they, at that time they didn't do anything. So they got enough complaints and finally they made everybody uh, get their money back because they considered it a speed trap. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a funny one here that was in the news. Uh, a, a guy was doing um, about 30 kilometers over the actual speed limit but the cops decided to chase him and they were starting to do, you know what happened? The police also got fined for driving over the speed limit. Really? They just said, you should just get, send him the ticket. We're going to send him a ticket because we can capture him on camera, but now you're going the same speed to chase him down. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah that's crazy. So it was, it's quite amusing. Your country was Formosa, right? In, initially. Taiwan, well, yeah. I mean, originally, well, it was... Formosa for a very long time. Um, it, Taiwan's official name is Republic of China. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, and it's a weird place. I mean, you when two million more people than the state of Florida, so it's pretty close. Twenty three million. Yeah, yeah, twenty three million. I mean, it's it's a weird place. I mean, because for example, like okay, every country in Taiwan has a diplomatic mission, but they're not allowed to call it an embassy because then China freaks out. So usually they call it, for example, like, okay, the United States is called the American Institute in Taiwan. They do the same work as an embassy. So because of that, and because Taiwan cannot really join certain international organizations, it's kind of beneficial in some ways. For example, um, it has its good side and its bad side. So Taiwan's economy has pretty much remained stable for the last 20 years. When other countries are neighbors, and in Europe, they, well, we're going into recession here, it pretty much remained the same. Only because of one industry, microchips. That is the number one industry in Taiwan, uh, TSMC, which I, I think everything that around you right now and here, ha, anywhere in the world has microchips from them. Their factory has more security than the Ministry of Defense in Taiwan. Really? That's how important it is. So. Even, for example, when, when COVID hit, there were a lot of people that came to Taiwan and they were visiting, and then they had to stay here for one year because they, there were no flights. They couldn't travel anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit of a surreal thing. Like I was watching the news, seeing what was going on 
in Australia, in, the, in, in China, the US, and in Europe, and Canada, and Australia, and going, well, wait a second, this is so foreign to us, because here, there, there were no lockdowns. There was only a one-week lockdown at the beginning, so they can find, they were able to figure out what the situation was. Locking down and, and closing schools and all this, and closing businesses, that was just not on the table, because the government knew that if they did that, the election that was held, the um, midterm election that was held a few months later, they would have lost everything. Mm, makes sense. And pretty much everything stayed open. And it was weird because Harding Davidson, which has been in Taiwan since 20, 2000 or 2001, COVID, the two years of COVID was the best years they ever had in Taiwan. Oh, yeah. That's the incredible. best years. No, nobody was traveling. Everybody was buying motorcycles. Harding Davidson in Taiwan had to bring in bikes from Australia and Singapore and Japan just to meet demand. It was the first time ever. Wow. Uh, it was, it was, and it, it was weird. Like I, I was sending pictures of friends of mine, shopping malls were all full. The night markets were all full. People were still going to cinemas. Um, there were certain situations where you had to wear a mask. If it was in um, a very, uh, very small enclosure or an enclosure with a lot of people, you had to wear a mask. It, it wasn't like, you know, barren streets or it was just weird. So that's why I said, like, when I was here and the foreigners that were stuck here and even Taiwanese were watching the news going, something's weird here because this is why I say Taiwan is in a weird situation like that. Some of those things that even there was another one many years ago called SARS, even when SARS happened, yeah, Taiwan kind of that. missed the curve on that one. But saying that, like with the economy, the economy is pretty much stable. Nothing goes up. But nothing goes down. Uh, so, like, wages, for example, have pretty much been the same for the last 20 years. Mm, okay. You're uh, isolated. You're kind of your own own thing out there in the water. You know, you're kind of like your, your own thing. But you got the mainland China that I'm reading right now is I don't really follow politics too much. Mm -hmm. You got that China always there. And well, the China has been there for 70, 70 years now. Yeah. I mean, most, most Taiwanese, when they, when they see, like, if they watch American TV news or news from overseas and China's sending all these ships around Taiwan and go, we've been doing that for 70 years. And the thing is, the reality is that a lot of that stuff they're doing is not is not really to send a message to Taiwan. It's it's more the Communist Party sending a message to their own people saying, look how strong we are. Right. And most most people in Taiwan just ignore it. And you know, there's so there's so much business between even right now when the situation is quite bad. There's so much business going on between Taiwan and China that, and, and so much investment, even the, you know, hardcore ones in, in China don't want to upset that. <laughs> you know, nobody. You guys nobody have mentioned. a lot, is it oysters that you get, they harvest there a lot? Oysters? Uh, no, we don't get, no, no, the oysters, no, we can't eat the oysters. There, there are oysters around Taiwan, but you can't eat them. You'll get, you'll die. Okay. Um, I, know. I, I saw a, I watched a little um, documentary on Taiwan and uh, it seems like a lot of people keep they have a lot of traditional customs like building those big fancy boats, I guess. Maybe it's more like for religion purposes, but people just seem to have a lot of more, uh, at least from this documentary, a lot, a lot of personal traditional things that keep them busy, you know. Well, it's, this is the other thing I said that's very weird about Taiwan. In some aspects, it's very traditional, but today the traditional side of the culture is more seen as, um, it's more practiced because, well, we've been practicing it for uh, 200 years or whatever, so we'll continue practicing it, but we're really a modern country. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know? it's That, um, that, that documentary could have been years ago. I didn't know how how long it was out, but it was pretty fascinating. And I know the weather there. I envy the weather and the mountains. And I see when I watch your videos, you don't just, you don't see that here unless you go down. If Hawaii has that, I've been to Hawaii, but it's weird when you see a, a body of water like the ocean and then just a huge mountain. That just kind of, we don't see that here unless, the first time I saw that in Hawaii, I was like, it took me a while to process that. that like, that's weird, but it's cool. Here's a good one. It was when? Today we're Sunday. It would be Friday. Snow. You get snow? Once a year. Very, 
very, very high up in the mountains. Oh, in the mountains, yeah. <laughs> Here, yeah. It's like the really only... Uh, we, we get this like, uh, weather usually once a year. It's usually sometime in December or January where the temperature gets cold. I say cold. Um, it's like a spring day, I don't know, in, in, in Seattle or upstate New York. Uh, but there's like maybe like two or three days that there's a little bit of snow at the top of the mountains. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty uh, much, we get all four seasons here. Like the Midwest and the United States, we have the four spring, summer, winter, fall, right? Right. So it's very frustrating when you're trying, when you have a Moto Vlog channel and it's freezing outside, right? So like, did I really make a good choice with my channel creation here? But no, I didn't do this. It was just a hobby that's turned into this, but... I'm very limited on my writing time. Like today is going to be nice. This next weekend, 60, like even into the seventies on Monday. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely going to try to ride that. You just have to get those opportunities to ride when you can, because you never know what the weather's going to bring here. Yeah. I mean, here, here we don't really get four seasons. We get two, which is, the, right. which is what we're in, but winter, I mean, today is like 2025 outside. And then it goes right to summer. Um, so today is with 20, 20 degrees out right now. Wow. Tomorrow, Monday, starting Tuesday, it's expected to go up to 36. And then in a week from now, we'll be up to 39. Okay. So if you take Celsius. a shower, a Celsius, yeah. Okay. I don't so if, you take a shower, if you take a shower, there's no point to use a towel because you, you towel yourself off, you just get drenched again with 100% humidity. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's extremes to everything. I sometimes wonder, should we move to Florida where it's more tropical? But then, then people say, uh, it sounds nice, but you get sick of that heat pretty quickly. <laughs> oh, also earthquakes. Yeah, and you have earthquakes there. We, we have them in kind of different areas of the country out west, you know, California area where the fault lines are. But I only felt one in my whole life here in Ohio. So you don't, you don't see it too much. It's, it's really funny because earthquakes here happen quite frequently. Really? Uh, we just had a, a 6.2 or four days ago. Wow. But the reaction here, because we get them so often, is like, oh, it's an earthquake. Okay, fine. There's an, and people people really, we don't pay it, even, we, nobody pays attention to it anymore. I mean, it's it's funny when. Really? Yeah, because they happen all the time. They just happen literally at least once a month. You're going to get one or two earthquakes of 5.0 to 6.0 guaranteed. And then little little small ones during you know during the day. Oh man, here it would make huge news if that happened here. Everything's dramatized here in, in the states. When if you watch news, I don't watch the news though. So it's depressing, isn't better it? Better off that way. Um, the news is depressing. Oh yeah, I quit that years ago, and, and now then as soon as if the news comes on after something we're watching, it's like you notice that stuff right away, like how dramatic and and how they want to just throw that stuff at you as quickly as they can all the drama and all the negativity you know like immediately and, and i try to change the channel as quickly as possible <laughs> Here, here's a here's one for you and this is something uh, that it was involving harley davidson that even harley davidson riders in taiwan could not understand was that whole bud light thing nobody here could understand it and most people here were saying, why don't they just go and ride and don't care what the companies do? You have a motorcycle, go and ride it. Stop bitching and complaining. Their PR marketing people just ignore them. Yeah, so that, that was a big deal here in this country when Bud Light, they did a commercial for marketing. Mm -hmm. Hired a marketing girl that, that did a commercial with a transgender person uh, who, and I don't know the, I don't know the lifestyle, but here in this, in this country, there, it's a big deal about transgender. Uh, you, you either have the people that accept it or don't accept it. It's a big, big divide there. So mm -hmm. Bud Light did this commercial that featured a transgender person drinking a Bud Light in um, Dylan Mulvaney, I think. Um, and it just, wow, all these people just blew it up that didn't, that they, they can't accept that yet. You know, so we have a big divide right now still. And it, it may take a long time to get over that, but it's kind of a, um, about control. Uh, I don't know why. If people want to be who they are, I'm, as long as you're not hurting anyone or hurting society, why not? You know. But some people can't accept that yet. So Bud Light, um, I 
don't know if they fired her or not, but it they they took a big hit for that, and nobody and they were boycotting Bud Light like around the country. Nobody would buy it. They were giving it away. I mean, it's just just because of that one commercial. See, that was weird because uh, I know that some of the Hardy, the real hardcore Hardy channels, at the time were were talking about that. And friends of mine who are Hardy writers here and even on the Hardy clubs on their Facebook pages, they couldn't understand what what's the big deal. Does it? You you have a bike, go ride it. It doesn't matter what they do. If you don't want to drink their beer, don't drink their beer. It doesn't matter. Other people will. They they couldn't. They they. You see that that kind of issue here in Taiwan. This is not what divides Taiwan. You know what divides Taiwan? And again, it's a very what divides Taiwan is not issues like that. It's by issues of those who don't want to have a relationship with China and those that want to have a closer relationship with China. That's what divides Taiwanese. These other issues, nobody could care a hoot about. Yeah, that would be refreshing if that would happen here. But I'm not sure. I guess a lot of Harley riders here are. I, I didn't know that that was the big deal for them about the Bud Light. Um, it was. Oh, more- some of the Hardy Davidson channels, the stuff they were saying, like, oh my God. Yeah, uh, I can imagine that. But, you know, you, Harley is uh, not only a bike, it's a culture, you know. And so you have to understand the people that ride, not everyone, but a lot of Harley riders fit that culture mode, you know, the hardcore leather, manly men. And, you know, just, it. I don't know if I've even right, saying the right terms, but it's it's definitely its own culture. Um, mm mm-hmm. And I, I think a majority of them could not accept the fact that that somebody might be transgender. I, I don't know. I yeah, that's that's actually interesting that you mentioned that because the last time I was in the U.S., a friend of mine said he wanted to go to Sturgis, so we went to Sturgis, mm-hmm. and I was I was driving a BMW GS for that, and this was the weird thing. I went there. I'm glad I went, but I never felt so uncomfortable in my life when I was parking the bike. People, people I could just see their reaction like don't how dare you park your bmw next to my harley davidson yeah you know it's like a religion type you know kind of like if you're not part of that if you don't have the harley emblem you're not welcome or something now Mm -hmm. say that's the case for every harley rider but uh, a lot of it is and a lot of harleys are associated with gangs like hell's angels and you know the mongols and stuff so it's we have that gang culture here too in the states that they're all Harleys. I mean, if I showed up with a scooter, you'd probably, I, I, I probably might, wouldn't be here, I guess, but <laughs> we don't attempt that. But there are channels out there where they, there's some guys that will infiltrate like a, a bar with a lot of Harleys and, you know, down to earth, I think everybody's good people. But when you get the people together, I mm-hmm. think they get headstrong and, and they want to fit into that culture. And that's probably why you see those things. Yeah, this uh, every May, Hardy Davidson Taiwan have a have a get together which lasts for like three days. And it's interesting because this is where it's very different. Hardy Davidson Taiwan says, "Come with any bike you have, any scooter you have." People will show up with these old fifty cc scooters to this Hardy Davidson event, and they literally just park them with every everything else. Because the thing is, the Hardy Davidson riders here also own scooters, which they use every day to go to work. Yeah, I get comments all the time where guys um, buy these adventure bikes and they also have a Harley. And because it's so easy, they just hop on and go and they, it's not heavy. They can just, you know, Harley has its own riding style where maybe like a an automatic has, has a different riding style. So I wish I could own like several bikes. I would have a sport bike, the adventure bike, a cruiser. I'd have them all because it just depends on your mood, what you want to go out and do that day, you know. Which, which sport bike do you like, if you had to choose one right now? Well, it's a funny story. Um, I was really into the Ninja line, the Kawasaki 400. Mm-hmm. Ever since I rode a Ninja 400, I loved it. I mean, that was just at a demo day. And I have a video on it, and I like that bike a lot. And then I, recently I met a guy that owns a dealership right here in town who raced. He, he did moto racing, uh, AMA on the track, right? And he's a lot of Ducati. That's why I was asking the question the other day. That Ducati that I video, that was actually in his shop. And that was the bike that he rode on the track. Mm-hmm. His name's Les. He actually participated in the Daytona 200 years ago. So he's a race-minded guy. I've never ridden 
and a is it called an Aprilia? Aprilia? Yeah, Aprilia. Ducati. Uh, I want to, and I might have that opportunity this year with him, but that'll be fun. But I've always liked the Ninja. I guess in the the BMW was it the M one thousand R was I think just a little bit too much um, for me. It it had it was just way powerful. You got to be careful on those big super bikes. I think the four hundred was intriguing because it was so light and nimble. It kind of reminded me of the lightness of my bike. It might be a little heavier with more man maneuverability and power. <laughs> The the only sport bike that I uh, somebody asked me what what did you feel like when you when you rode it for a day and I said well in the first hour I felt like I had a lot of poo coming out of myself the Hayabusa oh yeah I've seen those and it was modified mm -hmm. and they tinkered with the ECU to get way more horsepower but they didn't tell me <laughs> surprise it, it was I was very yeah, but it was quite um, interesting. I mean, the, the I I had a Ducati, and the, my my only problem that I had with the Ducati, and the only reason why I didn't like it, even though like I love I love the bike, was that unlike my uh, my Honda or my Yamaha MT10, if I go into the city and ride at low speed because I'm in the city, it was fine. With the Ducati, it just didn't feel comfortable in the city doing. Stop, go, stop, go, stop, go all the time. Right. You know what I mean? You're right. Yeah. And that's why I like the little automatic I have because, you know, that, that has, when I live, I live in a very populated, like, suburbia type. It's outside of the city of Cincinnati, but there's still a lot of people. A lot of traffic, a lot of cars. If you watch any of my videos, you see that the, the, the area that I'm in is very populated unless I drive way out into the country. So the stopping and going and the, the quick turning and stuff, it's perfect for a little bike like that, you know. Do you see many on the road? No, I don't see many scooters or automatics. Once in a great while in the summer, I might see one or two. It's just not a very popular thing. And that may be because I live in Ohio, which is only, like I said, four, four or five months, maybe four good months of riding opportunity. So you see mm -hmm. the scooters more in the warmer like climates that states like Florida and California, you see them a lot more than Ohio. It's just not popular in Ohio, I don't think. When you buy a scooter in the U.S., I heard that the U.S. has this thing where you see this one price, but then when you get to the dealership, it's a different price with cars. I, I didn't find that here at my dealership. Okay. Um, yeah, they advertised it for, it was in the 4,000 range, and then everything, by the time I got out the door, it was five even. But it was pretty close to what the M, the MSRP is called, you know, right. manufactured so I, I didn't experience that. It might be somewhere different in the other parts of the country, but mine was pretty accurate. And in the U.S., if you buy a scooter, do you have to buy it outright, or can you take like a payment plan? Yeah, I, I uh, you can finance it. I financed mine at the time for something like 36 months or 48 months, but I eventually just paid it off because I didn't want to pay that interest, you know? So I'm like, I could have paid cash for it, but at the time, I'm just like, yeah, I'll save my cash for something else. So I just finance it, but then I got to thinking more, after about a year or two of ownership, I'm like, I'm just going to pay this thing off if I have the money because it's like, you're, why why spend the interest, you know? But yeah, you can finance them if your credit's good enough. And and how is, um, the, let's say, service-wise? Because like I said, here there's, I mean, you could, there's somebody you can shake a stick at, repair shops and service centers. But I'm wondering, what is it like if you say when you have one or two in your area? I think service would be, the dealership that I bought my bike from, they actually have a service department. So you'd have to take it there and service it. I, I, it's pretty reasonable, but the guy I just met that owns his own power sports shop, they do service there too. So they're, they're, they're kind of strategically placed around the city, you know? I don't think uh, it's a big problem, I would say. Uh, you, you can get stuff serviced, and especially the little bikes like mine, I just do a lot of it myself, but anything major, like an engine issue or something. Now I have a guy that I could probably trust to take it to. So you just have to find where they're where they're at. In in Taipei we have one street and it's a ten block. It's about a length of ten blocks. On either side of the shop are scooter shops, secondhand scooter shops. And if you go walking there, 
and you walk out of one shop, the guy next door will say, no, you don't want to buy from him. You want to buy from me. I can sell you the same scooter. I can sell it cheaper and I'll give you a better bargain. And then the other guy will come and say, what can they buy? You don't have to haggle. They start haggling with themselves. That's funny. Yeah. It's a, lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of competition there. Yeah. It's not like that here. You, you just have to find the dealership and drive to it or have it towed there, but it, they're not like next to each other all the way down the road or anything. That, that's a big difference that you guys have. I can see that. What is the second-hand market like? I usually go online. Like, you can go on Facebook Marketplace, they call it. Cycle Trader, which is a big popular website out there around the country, and you can find them. They're sporadic, though. I don't think, like, scooters are a big market right now and maybe never will be. I think they're getting more and more popular slowly, um, especially with the introduction of YouTube and channels like you know, where you're just showing your rides and people get that thought like, oh, maybe I should try one of those out, you know, so, but right now it's still kind of the secondhand market. You don't see a ton of scooters. I don't look that often because I'm not interested in one, but I think the new market would be probably a little bit more available for that type of thing. I, I say that because if you're, if you ever see one particular model, it's the Yamaha. Okay. Here we call it the BWS. In the U.S., I think it's sold as the Scoot the Yamaha Scoot, to 125. If you ever see one from 2014, 2015, they shouldn't be very expensive, buy it. This but this scooter will put a smile on your face. Is it ST125? Sounds familiar. Uh, the Scoot, Scoot 125. Scoot 125, okay. Yeah. Hmm. It will put a smile on your face. It's small wheelbase, it's very nimble. It feels like a comedy scooter, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it's... If you take it in the twisties because it's small wheelbase, you don't you'll you'll just you'll you will just laugh. You will just I laugh. Keep that in mind. Okay, cool. The guy that I met what I was telling you about that um they do track racing. They have track days, right? So they go mm -hmm. out and they take their their souped up track bikes and they have a Honda Ruckus for their their little travel bike that goes from like pit to pit or wherever they go. They use this little ruckus to put like little parts on and stuff and I'm like What's that ruckus for? Because it had his logo on it. He's like, oh, that's our utility scooter. We just <laughs> hop back and forth on that if we got to go from building to building or whatever. I've never been to a track day, so I'm not sure what he was talking about. But mm -hmm. use that as their little commuter bike. <laughs> here here in the mountains, uh, there's one particular road in North Taiwan that we call it the Scooter Monkey Road. Because it's all these guys between the ages of 18 and 22. They have these 125, 150 cc's modified like you wouldn't believe. Some of them even include nitro tanks to give them that boost of power in the curves. And the fun, the funny thing, if you go and you just, um, find a cafe somewhere and just watch them, it's almost like watching these old American teenage movies when the teenagers have their cars and they're doing the drag racing. Mm -hmm. you know? And there's always some guys at, 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 at either side of this, this one road, uh, CB radios, so they're talking, oh, the police are coming, everybody kind of disperses. <laughs> Wow. I know there's Grom gangs, the Honda Groms. Yes. Uh, my son owned one of those. I've, I've ridden one of those. They, they have these little Grom gangs that go around. I've seen like, you'll see like 15 of them just like real loud exhaust and stuff. They trick them out. The thing that I don't see a lot here is it's very hard to find accessories for like a bike like mine here. You have to get them online or from Taiwan or some or um, Thailand and have them shipped here. But I would like to really modify my bike, mm -hmm. actually with some decals and stuff, you know, just change the look, you know, there, but you have to go to eBay or you have to find them. I should send you a link for a Taiwan store. It's an if online ship store. to the U.S., I would be very interested. Uh, no, I, I mean, I would have to buy it for you and then ship it because they, they only accept payment in Taiwan dollars. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll send you their link. Okay. Because, um, and I believe also they have a selection for English. They have stuff that I know that you probably, because the, your, the, the, the Honda bike that you have is, here in Taiwan, we don't get the 150. That we don't, well, there's only a few on the road, but they're not brought in by Honda. The most popular ones are the 350 and upward. But this shop, uh, th these, this one site called Chopi, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been this, this thing that you see with a lot of um, classic bikes. There may be companies like Royal Enfield that have a long history, Jawa and others, and then they, they issue designs of bikes from the 1950s. Okay, they have fuel injection, electric start and everything. What I've kind of noticed with them is first, 
their fanboys are completely nuts, even more hardcore than Hardy Davidson sometimes. But has are, are, are this modern movement of classic or vintage looking bikes, has that caught on in the US? I don't see it. Like I said, maybe in other parts of the country, but being Ohio, I don't really see a lot of bikes in general. I think the most that I see, if I do, are, of course, Harleys. That's, the, I think, the majority of the, the ones I see cruising around are, would be Harley Davidson. And then you got your sport bike crowd that zoom up and down the highways. Mm -hmm. A lot of trick, trick stuff going on, but just speed. But yeah, I don't see any, uh, I don't see many of those that you were talking about at all, at least around my area. <laughs> and, and for example, in, in oh, you said you're in Ohio, mm -hmm. with other riders, what is like the average age of riders there? Well, the sport bike crew is younger mm -hmm. and the Harley riders are kind of more like middle age, I would say, 30s to 50s on up. Okay. The sport bikes, you know, it's just being that age where speed is kind of like you're young you still want that speed factor you're having fun you're still trying to figure out your yourself so a lot of the sport bike guys are younger and that was kind of the same way when i was younger although when i hopped on a sport bike i got that feeling back like oh, wow that would be fun you know um, so but i that's why i need several bikes but yeah that's kind of like what i see it anyway on the road yeah here it's here it's a little different because the hardy davidson riders here Tend to between tend to be between the ages of 25 and 40. Okay. Whereas the sport bike riders tend to be everything from 25 all the way to 75. Really? It is very different. I mean, Indian. Uh, the the riders that ride Indian, they tend to be older because Indian bikes in the 60s and 70s used to be used by the Taiwan police force and the military. So a lot of that generation remember Indian motorcycles for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but for Hardy, for Hardy Davidson, they're they're much much younger. Interesting. Uh, I've seen it even in Australia, for example, or even in, in Europe. Um, well, the last time I went back home, a friend of mine said to me, "We were talking about a new Harley Davidson shop that opened up in Almere, which is the part of the Netherlands where I live." I asked him, well, where, where is this Hardy Davidson shop? And he said, oh, it's right next to the retirement home. And he, sure enough, it actually was yeah. right next to a retirement home. I thought That's he was funny. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, the sport bike scene around here, we have a major bypass road, they call it. It's a bypass from a loop that goes around for a major road. So on that bypass, it's 55. You'll see some of the videos that I ride up and down this. And it's a good couple of miles but you have the drag races going on with cars and um, motorbikes, a lot of sport bikes. You'll hear them all throughout the night, just loud with the modified exhausts and stuff. And it's like the super high pitched, you know, the sound that you get on a modified exhaust on these mm -hmm. sport bikes, like the 400 sounds and stuff. I hear them all the time, but uh, the Harleys are the big rumbling, just cruising around. You'll hear those too, but uh, so there's different just different classifications of people that like that kind of stuff. Now, with your when you got a license, what is the situation? I mean, for example, here in in Taiwan, to get a motorcycle license, um, if you have a car license, you can ride anything up to ninety cc, and then you need a special license for ninety cc to two hundred and fifty cc, and everything over two hundred fifty cc, you have to take another license test what about in, in ohio really that's interesting i think it's just one one option here anything i th believe over 50 cc's i think it's 50 cc's uh or maybe it's 125 it requires a, a motorcycle endorsement they call it so i already have my driver's license of course but in order to ride my bike legally on the road I had to take a test, like a computer test, where you have to answer a bunch of questions and pass it. Mm -hmm. And um, once you passed it, then you either have to take a rider's course, which I did because it's a long story, but I took the rider's course because I wanted to learn more. And I also, if you take the rider's course and you pass it, that then you don't have to take the riding exam at the BMV. They waive it. Okay. So you can take the course and, and avoid that. Or if not, you just have to go up to the BMV, they call it, 
and you have to do their little course test through some cones and stopping distances and stuff and mm -hmm. if you pass you get a little tiny m on your license driver's license it's a motorcycle endorsement and then you're it's good for life you just have to pay for your registration every year for your tags right <laughs> yeah and you know here here when you get your your motorcycle license the way it's set up so we have different colored plates uh bikes yeah. under 90 cc are green white plates are 90 cc to uh, 250 yellow plates are 250 to 500 cc and anything above 500 cc is red and how how they do it so if if you get your uh, a lot of people, when they become 18, will get their white plates, so they can ride any bike from 90 cc to uh, 250 cc. But they have to wait one year before they can take their test for yellow, and then wow. two more years before they can take their test for red. So it sounds to me that the that's going to make just organically better riders because of that time and experience. Well, I mean, you've you've probably heard this kind of story yourself. A guy drives 150 cc, then goes out and buys a 1,000 cc. I'm like, that's asking for that. That is just asking for something to go wrong. Well, what's even more crazy is here in the states, you can just get your temporary permit and ride any bike you want. <sighs> no, here you no experience. These guys are getting on these you know, thousand cc bikes that's never ridden in their life. Yeah, that that's that's crazy here, and that's what is. I think should be changed sometime, but and there it's not enforced even. You got people that ride bikes to the today that they don't even have a license. They don't even have a proper registration. But what I heard, mm -hmm. the law just does really never pulls over a motorbike here, mm -hmm. unless you're doing something wrong, you know. But they leave them alone, so it's a big thing here too. Just the other day, there was a 20-year-old in, in southern Taiwan who was riding um, a KTM Duke. Yeah, I like those. Uh, 320 cc. He'd already been taking the last week, this, this week, the course to get the license for that bike, which would be a yellow plate. And he still had two days before taking the exam, but already bought the bike and was already riding it. And he got into an accident. Mm. Well, guess what happened? They took away his license for 10 years. What? Yeah. Wow. They said all you had. They said all you had to do was wait two more days. Two more days. That's a shame. It also yeah. didn't help. That he had no insurance. Yeah. Because he couldn't get insurance because he didn't have the proper license for that bike. So, right. you know, it sounds, I mean, like, it sounds like over there that things are a little more controlled, a little more enforced, and I would think. I wouldn't say. That. <laughs> Have you ever have you ever seen a 125 cc scooter with a whole family on it? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. More in more in Thailand and Philippines though. I watch a lot of cams. Like uh, for some reason, I like watching these cams that are at intersections in like Thailand and stuff. And mm -hmm. you see a family of going by on a motor scooter, like four people and a dog. Just and I'm like, wow. They can't do that here. They would definitely be. Uh, pulled over for that but <laughs> i mean I, I when i was in 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 vietnam i saw somebody moving a refrigerator on their scooter mm, you got to get places man you know and the thing that's interesting is that you know when when honda came out with their super cub in the late 50s which is i think now the most mass produced vehicle of all time like over a hundred million of them have been made What's interesting is that little tiny, originally 50 cc bike, which is now 125 cc. Mm -hmm. That bike has just the, the idea of having that little tiny motorcycle on the market has created jobs for people, created new opportunities, has moved nations in and, and people in the millions just from one little. Yeah single bike the same with 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 scooters as well it's quite it it's quite incredible i mean for, for you and me who who ride for pleasure because we enjoy it mm -hmm. it's different but you know when you see people in especially in in in, in the philippines or thailand or indonesia yeah. vietnam cambodia burma and they use them as as working vehicles yeah it's quite extraordinary i have to say it's it's this, this tiny little machine yeah, yeah. that reports the whole family yeah, I did a segment on that too, like about why Americans 
there are more toys here than instead of commuters because we got the longer distances between our jobs and the major highway system. So anybody, most people here in the States that have a bike, whatever kind it is, is more for a, just a, an enjoyment factor. It's not, the large majority of them are not used for daily commuting. Although they, there's cases where they do, I would say, man, probably a good 90% of ownership for bikes are probably just toys, you know, uh, just a, a luxury item versus like how in other countries. And I did a video on that years ago, but yeah. So maybe it'll take off more when we had that big rise in gas prices. I don't know if you guys experienced that in Taiwan a couple of years ago where the gas prices just went phew, crazy. Well, you see, this is the funny thing, you know, um, when, when, during that time when I saw uh, fuel prices in the U.S. jump, yeah, Taiwanese were saying, it's so cheap, even with that price, considering how much we pay per liter. <laughs> I mean, wow. if, if I convert our liter, uh, I, I think I think a gallon, uh, one U.S. gallon has four liters, I believe, uh, or just a little bit less. Yeah, I think it's four. Four, it's around four. I know there's the Imperial one, which is the British one, but it's, say, around four liters. For us, four liters, so one gallon, comes out to around maybe seven or eight dollars, depending on where in Taiwan you are. Wow. And that's, price has always been that way. Really? See, our, I just saw the gas price yesterday. It was like 309 for a gallon. Oh, send some of that here. We want to pay that price. <laughs> So you don't realize how fortunate you have it with stuff when you're from, if you don't explore the world, you know, so that that's why I think it's cool to collaborate with folks like this, other people that enjoy the motorbikes to get a sense of, hey, how's it there in your country? How's it here? You know, and I think I appreciate you have, taking the time to do that with me today. If there's a ride that uh, one day you have time and you want to do it, there's two places I would suggest you go and ride. You can rent a bike there and it's super cheap. The first is Mongolia. Okay. I'll you can rent that for next weekend. You can rent an old Soviet uh, bike. Oh, wow. For a week for maybe $100 for the week. Okay. That would be fun. It is the most extraordinary country to ride in because Mongolia, which is the size of, which is larger than the whole size of Western Europe, a million people, there are two national roads. In Mongolia, the road is wherever you go. <laughs> right. The next one is Vietnam. Okay. Riding uh, from the south all the way to the north in Ho Chi Minh. It is, it is one of those things that, it's one of those moments when you ride and you're riding and sometimes you just stop and you just look around and you go, wow. Yeah. You know, and especially Vietnam because... <clears throat> Riding in Vietnam, it's sort of like you have the sounds that maybe you, you heard in movies like Apocalypse Now or Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams. Just the sounds that are there and just the whole surrounding. And you just go, I mean, and, and then all of a sudden, one day you have this beautiful sunny weather and then you're pissed on in a gigantic monsoon where you can't see hardly anything in front of you and you get drenched. Anyway, look, I, sh I should let you go because you said that you have something to do today. Yeah, this has been fun. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, we'll do it again, Mike. We'll do it again sometime. But what I wanted to tell you is, in, do you have any videos or can you make any videos of up there in the mountains? The twisties in the mountains would be a very uh, nice visual to see. How would you like one? And I, I have to find out what hard drive it's on. But where there's a mountain here that goes up, uh, 6,000 meters. You have to wear a coat, probably, right? Well, it starts off, uh, I, I think I made it last summer, where I'm in beautiful blue sky and literally go to the peak of the mountain and it's in the clouds. Ooh, that'd be cool. That'd be interesting. And it's interesting if you see the whole, the whole change of it as you go up. And what's interesting as well, because this is an earthquake zone, there are a lot of hot springs on the side. So there's some moments where my camera is capturing the steam coming out of the mountains. Yeah, you should post that one. That would be interesting. I'll have to dig that one up. I know I have it somewhere. Mount mountain riding is my favorite. I have to say it is yeah. one of my favorite. Well, that I don't have around here. So I, I envy like some of these videos that I watch with like you guys wear the mountains or itchy boots that get, I man, we just don't see that here. It's just a lot of pavement, houses, 
But I'm going to try. I keep saying this every year. I'm going to try to stretch my legs a little bit more this year and get out and see some really cool stuff. But we'll do this again sometime, man. I appreciate all your time today. All right. Look, you have a good day. Hey, you too, bud. We'll all right. Again sometime and uh, just keep, keep in contact. And once we think of some more things, maybe as I get some more rides in and stuff, we'll have some more content to think about, right? Sure. No problem. And I'll, I'm going to dig up that video of mountains for you. Yes, do so. All right. Okay. Talking to you, Keith. You too. Bye-bye, Scott. Bye-bye.